Hi, everyone, and welcome to this week's episode of Rock Your Shine After You Have Been Cracked Wide Open. I want to thank my listeners for tuning in for a conversation that I have really been looking forward to. I'd like to introduce to you today Kevin Meisner, who is a brilliant artist and musician. We are longtime colleagues. We reconnected recently and I asked Kevin to be on the show. He has got a powerful story to share with us today. And just to set the stage a little bit, Kevin has had many life-altering events that have happened over the course of his life, starting with his divorce in 2001. Kevin then had, was very sick with a life-threatening ulcer that ruptured and then lost his dad to suicide in 2005. So we have a lot to cover today. And I want to thank you, Kevin, for being on the show. Well, so thank you so much for having me. And you know, it's the the old adage, you know, it's it's who you know. <laughs> yeah, right. So that's I right. want to thank you for, for, for having me out here. For giving you like this 30 minutes of fame. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I'll take 14 and a half. I'm not proud. <laughs> well, and you guys can see that Kevin is in his studio and we'll be getting into his art in a little bit. So Kevin, let's start. I think that one of the reasons I wanted you on the show for many reasons, but I think after hearing your story, there were these steps, as you said, that kind of brought you into a pretty dark place. You can start anywhere in your story, but I know that the divorce was kind of a turning point in your life. But if you want to start before that, please do. Yeah, I, I, I guess I'll start with a little anecdote. I was talking with my daughter, Lee, who at the time was a teenager and she was deeply into Titanic and all that stuff. And she thought, oh, you know what? I bet I was a reincarnated person from the Titanic. I'm like, oh, that's fine. That's cool. So we were talking about reincarnation. And I said, you know, life is fine and everything. It's okay. But I don't want to go through this again, because it's kind of dull. You know, there's really not much going on in my life. I, I get up, I go to work, I pay the bills. And you know, do I need to do this again? And apparently the universe said, hold my beer, because it was from there on that things just went down the crazy train. After this conversation with your daughter. Oh, yeah. I think I had switched a job at the time. I was working for the American Red Cross. I was a, I was a trucker. I would take all the equipment to a blood drive and set it up. And while people like Sue would come in and give, give blood, I would take the stuff and I'd take it back to, to Portland and do all that, that stuff. And they were very long days. Those were like 15, 16 hour days. Tiresome. So I decided that, you know what, I want to be the people that one of the people that stick the needles in because why, why not? I've seen the people who do it. I can do that. So I decided to become a phlebotomist. And in my training, unfortunately, I got involved in, I hate to say it, a romantic entanglement. And one thing that I was always very careful about. I've always had female friends, but I always knew that, you know, I'm a married man. You know, there, there are limits, you know? And so I was, I was torn and I went to my wife and I was telling her about how torn I was about this, this path that I was, I was going down. And then she decided to take that opportunity to divulge that. Well, she's been there, done that. She's been in love with somebody for, about 10 or 11 years and that kind of cracked everything wide open from there i just want to stop i mean people are probably seeing me laughing when you're telling this very hard story but <laughs> everybody needs to know you probably see that kevin has an amazing sense of humor and so we worked together for when we were younger at ll bean and that's what he would do is make me laugh all day so that's why i'm laughing i'm not being insensitive all right so i want to just say something like all joking aside you were sort of, you know, being that stand up human and being very honest that you were having these, you know, romantic feelings. Your wife drops this bomb. Your wife at the time drops this bomb that she has been in yeah. love with somebody for a decade. What happens mm -hmm. from there, though? I mean, oh, and one other thing I want to also preface this, that you've got these jobs, but your heart and your calling has always been around your art, your music and your art. Ooh. And so... 
at that point, you were not, you know, you were trying to, you know, you had a job, your jobs were about making a paycheck to pay your bills. I just mm-hmm. wanted to put that out there. Okay. So now your wife drops this bomb on you. What happens? How do you respond? Like, well, what what happened was, and this is when my innate selfishness kicked in. I said, well, you know what? If you love him more than me, then fine. You're free. Go after it. And I'll just continue down the, the road that I'm on, which the road that I was on eventually led to the road into the ICU with bleeding ulcer because it was it was not a, a stable relationship to say the least. So I never held anything against you know my first wife. I could empathize. I could say, hey, you know, I know how you feel. I know how you felt. So when I went on my path, it was still extremely difficult because I was still living in the house. You know, there was the kids. You know, we decided we were going to, you know, split up and get a divorce. But, you know, those things take time. And it, it just gnawed away at me in the form of um, an ulcer that eventually ruptured. And we're not going to make, we're going to go into the rupture because that literally you, you almost lost your life. And this train that you were on just was slowly going off the rails, obviously. I want to just, yes. I want to slow down around the, the split up because divorces can be super traumatic, even if it's, I mean, best case scenario in a divorce, both people want it, right? It can be super painful when one wants it and the other one doesn't. In this case, you, I don't know that you wanted the divorce, but you were open to it, given that you were also having these other feelings. So you had this other relationship going on at work. You were going through this divorce. It caused a tremendous amount of stress, which added to this or perhaps caused this ulcer. It ruptures. At this point, when you are in ICU, are you still going through the divorce? Yes. I hadn't moved out of the house yet. Okay. So every day was me being somewhere that I didn't want to be, Mm. you know, living with someone I didn't want to live with and, you know, waiting for the time when it would be opportune because, you know, for the children, stay together for the children. And it was, it was too much. I've always been a rather impatient person. And when I see the path in front of me that I want to take, I want to go now, let's go. I don't want to wait around forever. So patience has never been my strong suit. And how and old were the children? Yeah. And did they, were your children, did they know what was happening during this time? How old were they at the time? I believe my my oldest was in her last year of high school. And my son was just going into high school. So they were in their teens. Did they know um, what was happening? Had you my, talked to the children about it? We did. We We did tell them that we were going to get a divorce. And I'll tell you what. That was the worst day of my life when we sat down and told them, you know, Ugh, never want to do that again. Don't I don't wish that that feeling that dread upon anyone. My daughter, old enough to kind of understand my son hit him a little differently. You know, he had some some troubles with that. I tried to be there with him as, as much as possible. But yeah, he went through several years of hard times. It's devastating. Much, much it's better. Devastating. I'd like to thank BetterHelp for sponsoring this ad. Hey guys, I want to take a minute to offer an opportunity for those of you who've been searching for a mental health therapist and haven't had any luck getting callbacks. I know it's challenging to find help, so I've partnered with BetterHelp. They are the world's largest therapy service, and they are 100% online. With BetterHelp, you can tap into a network of over 30,000 licensed and experienced therapists who can help you with a wide range of issues. To get started, you just answer a few questions about your needs and preferences in therapy. That way, BetterHelp can match you with the right therapist from their network. Then you can talk to your therapist however you feel comfortable, whether it's via text, chat, phone, or video call. You can message a therapist at any time and schedule live sessions when it's convenient for you. 
If your therapist isn't the right fit for any reason, you can switch to a new therapist at no additional charge. With BetterHelp, you get the same professionalism and quality you'd expect from in-office therapy, but with a therapist who is custom-picked for you. More scheduling flexibility at a more affordable price. Get 10% off right now on your first month at betterhelp.com forward slash rock your shine. That's better H E L P dot com forward slash rock your shine. Now back to our episode. He, he is dev- it is devastating. People don't like to hear it. Divorce is a traumatic event for children. It just is. Mm. Children don't, children don't want to, children don't want their parents to split and it impacts them, you know, and as a, as a therapist for many, many years, I mean, I dealt with a lot of, I'm not saying that parents should stay together for the children because I am also not a proponent of that too. I think it, I think really though, it's understanding the gravity of what it is like for children so that parents can address that accordingly, right. And make sure these kids are getting the support that they need, because Mm -hmm. it sounds like you and your wife were trying to do this as amicably as possible. Absolutely. You know, we spent almost 20 years in marriage. And while 10 of that was somewhat loveless, we never argued. We didn't fight. We got along and that's the way we continued. It's the way we are still now, all these years later. So Thank goodness it, it wasn't that kind of environment in, in the house. It was something I didn't want, but for the kids, they didn't have to live through that kind of, of you know horror show. Right, which is right, exactly. So now you've had now you've got this health crisis. You have the ulcer, it ruptures, you need tons of blood, right? I can't remember mm-hmm. what you said. Yes. Well, I, I vaguely recall getting four. They billed me for five. So I guess I, I had five units of blood. That's five liters. Is it a liter? No. At any rate, five units of blood. My size would have, have approximately 10, maybe 11, 12 units of, of blood in them. And so I was basically running on empty. Wow. The amount of blood I, I had left in me after it all ruptured out. That's not the end of it, right? Because you end up losing your father after that to suicide. So this health crisis, at that point, did you have any epiphanies? Were you, or were you still on pure survival mode? Well, after I got out of the hospital and I I said, look, I got to move out. That's part of the reason why, you know, all this happened. I got to move out. So I moved out. My mother also had had a stroke. So she was quite ailing. My dad had had a series of strokes, so he was ailing. And in early January 2005, found out that he had taken his life. At that point in time, you know, I was still going through the, hard to believe, the the semi-relationship that I had been going through. I was drinking like a fish, had too much, you know. I, I, I've said that I was a, a functional alcoholic, but that's also a self-diagnosis. Everybody else just thinks you're lush. When I found out my my dad had died, I hate to admit it, but to be perfectly honest, I was so wrapped up in my own little sense, my own little world. It didn't hit me as it should have. You know, he was going through horrible times himself. And I was so wrapped up in me I didn't realize. I can't say my other brothers and sisters did either, but, you know, my dad and I weren't necessarily close growing up, but it it was something that should have affected me more than it did. But I was just too wrapped up in Did it ever affect you later? Did you, you know, we, we, we oftentimes we'll talk about, you know, delayed grief. Did it ever hit you? Did it ever impact you, his death? I guess with any time you've lost a parent or, you know, someone you love, you think every once in a while, oh, you know what? You know who would know the answer to that question? My dad would know the answer to that question. I should call him. Nope, can't do that. You know, that that kind of thing. But yeah, I, I would I would have to say that there there has been, you know, some grief with that. But again, it, it was never traumatic as far as any grief I had over his loss. 
And what it's about it, but it's true. No, that's okay. I mean, that's part of what this show is about, you know, in different ways that we handle the losses in our life and our family. But what about your mom? How did it impact your mother? Well, as a survivor from someone who has taken their life, she got very angry at him because she viewed it as a a act against her. Boy, she never wanted to talk his his name again after that. She was recovering from her stroke. She moved out to Pennsylvania, outside of Philadelphia. That's where her family was from. She stayed there from 2000. She moved quickly, 2005. And she moved back to Maine to live with us when her health was poor in 2012. For a few years, she did okay. You know, she was with her family. She was all right. But then her health issues came down. But she was always mad at him from there, there on. You know, just that boiled up anger. That how how could he have done this not to himself but how could he have done this to me? And that's and that's often the residual effects of suicide. If, if suicide, I think, is one of the more difficult to for people to comprehend. I think there there's guilt, there's anger, there's a whole bunch of different emotions that people carry when someone they love has taken their life. What was it like for you to? Were you because I know you have siblings. Were you supporting your mother through this grief or were you still just too wrapped up in your own? Because you had a lot going on in your own life. I was the one that was closest to my mother out of my four other two brothers, two sisters. So I was the closest to her. I'm the youngest. And so it was always up to me to go talk to mom about this or, you know, talk to her about that. So I was the go between between my siblings and my mom. I, I I did support her as far as emotionally, you know, whatever I could. So we, we had always been close. So, yeah, I, I maybe stepped outside of my own little bubble every once in a while to help her out. Let's go back to you, because what is happening in your About own About time. <laughs> <laughs> All right. What? Enough about me. What do you think about me? So what... <laughs> What is happening in your life? You you have the near-death experience. Your father takes his life. You've gone through div- the divorce I'm imagining is over by now. Yes. What are you doing? Are you living in an apartment? <laughs> like, what are you doing? <laughs> People have asked me that question. What are you doing? I was living in an apartment, a studio apartment in Harpswell, Maine. Beautiful place, right on the coast. My landlord. Lord was a uh, a piano teacher and his wife uh, works in in pastel. So she was an artist. So, you know, we we had some some common ground there. It was a a very Zen place to be. Unfortunately, I was still being pushed and pulled by that toxic relationship that I was in. But I was still I was trying to get away from from that as much as possible. Unfortunately, still heavily drinking. Why not? You know, I was, I was, you know, going through, I don't know, second puberty, second childhood, whatever it was, you know, woohoo, I'm young, I'm single, I'm going to drink, I'm going to party. Uh, not the happiest camper in, in town, but having the place that I lived in, again, that was, you know, that was the Zen. I could, I could come back there and, you know, still be somewhat normal. And all this time, I still painted. Good. I That's still, what I was just about to ask you. Yeah. Were you, you know, because you know, part of this podcast, obviously, the name is Rock Your Shine after you've been cracked wide open. And, you know, that's one of the reasons I really wanted you on the show is because I know that you gave your life over finally to this deeper calling, your art. But that took time. And you talked, you know, you you were saying before we started recording, you know, that we take these steps that take us down right into that dark place before we can take the steps to bring us out of that Talk to us about that, that demise and also the rise and what that looked like for you, because it wasn't an easy, it wasn't, an, it wasn't, it wasn't quick. I know that. <laughs> no, no, it's, it's never quick, right? Never quick enough. It's like, I, I can't be thin enough. I can't be rich enough. And I can't get out of this hole fast enough. The, the first good thing that happened was. I I met my soon to be, well not soon to be but my future wife Ellen. She came into my life. She was a very stable person. She's her equipoise is is wonderful. She is the kind of person that has 
no high highs, no low lows. If you want someone who is just nice and tranquil, that's her. And she helped me immensely. I, I knocked the drinking down by 90 percent. We, we moved in, I think, a few months after we got together and, and we lived in Cundies Harbor. And that was just, it was, again, a soothing presence. You know, it's the, the kind of person that I absolutely needed to come into my life. So that started to, to right the ship a little bit. She, you know, was behind me all the time with my, my artwork. You know, I was starting to really do more paintings and she would grab a painting and if I did a painting of somebody's lobster boat out in Cundy's Harbor. I didn't know the guy, but she knew of him. So when I was done with the painting, she grabbed it and took it to him and said, hey, you want to buy this? You know, I could never have done that. I don't think anybody else would have done that. And did, he buy, did he buy it? Yes, he did. He bought the painting. Wow. And a year later, I started working on that very same boat as a Sternman. <laughs> so... You know, little 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 things that that get you up. So I, I left my job for the American Red Cross to be a, a sternman on his boat. Sternman is a, a lobsterman term. You, you when you go out lobstering, you have you know your fishing boat. You got the captain, and you got the guy that messes with the bait. That would be me. I was I was bait boy. So I did that for a year because in my mind. The grander goal was to use whatever information I could glean from seeing the ocean working in that environment of using them in my artwork. So that was my hidden goal. I didn't tell Ellen that. But after the season was over and all the traps were back up on, on land, I said, that's it. I'm, I'm going to do this art thing full time. That's incredible because, and I, and I love what you said earlier, we are always given these breadcrumbs if we pay attention, right, to listen to our higher calling, what it is that our, I, people call it their true north, their intuition, their soul, whatever language you want to put to it, it's always there, right? We just need to pay attention and then we need courage because it takes a tremendous amount of courage to follow those breadcrumbs and have faith. I think when in our material world, of course, we need to make money to pay for our home and our food and all of these things. So I'm not saying, hey, everybody go quit your job and, you know, and yeah, and, you know, live on the street so that you can paint. But I do think that it does take courage to follow that deeper knowing of what brings us joy. And bringing us and and we are meant to shine our light because then we create more joy in the world. And so I'm just curious because following the artist way is not always the easiest way. What happened when you told your wife that you were going to do this full time? Because it, as you said, it can take a month to paint <laughs> a, a single painting that may or may not stop. <laughs> well, she was, again, very supportive. She knew that, you know, that's what I wanted to do. And she was she was behind me. She said, sure, as long as you make a lot of money. I said, absolutely. It's art. How tough can it be? I got into galleries. I was, I was selling work. You know, I thought, okay, this is fine. My, my price level may not have been extremely high. But, you know, I was selling stuff on a regular basis. And then unfortunately, old man recession hit and the art world dried up. It was tough. You know, I've always said for anyone who wants to go out and follow their creative endeavors, there are myriad ways that people will take your money for your passion than there are for ways for you to make money off of your passion. Right. Yeah. And when, when you realize that, you can take the blinkers off and just work on what you do. Don't worry about, you know, the selling and, and all of that other stuff. But you have to feel inside what you're doing, which yeah. leads me back a little bit in that I was painting pictures that ultimately I wasn't very happy with. 
I was doing things because I felt that it was, how do I, I say, I, I wasn't taking my art seriously. I was just saying, okay, you know, it's a painting, it's a, it's a lobster boat, it's a, it's a seascape, you know, that's what people want. But I didn't really want to do those. I really wanted to do something that was more meaningful to me. Except at the time, I didn't know what was meaningful to me. You know, my my listeners know that I'm a writer and it can take a while to get to the heart of the story. You've got to show up for your work. And we've talked about this. you got to show up every day for your work. Any artist out there knows that. I don't care if they're a musician, an artist, a writer. It really doesn't matter. you got to show up every day. You can't just wait until the muse hits you and be like, oh, I feel inspired today, or you'll never produce anything. So, I mean, because it is not... Sure. It is not an easy path to follow that the the calling of the of the artist's way, right? That's that's why we have belief systems out there that you know what do they call it the the starving artist? <laughs> I mean that, that that came from somewhere. So, yes. how did you discover what mattered to you as an artist? I think what what really worked the, another step in that direction was when my mother came to live with us. She was very ill. She was, you know, she had COPD, congestive heart failure. She was diabetic. But beyond that, she was wonderful. And as anybody who takes care of a senior, you know, a parent will tell you, it's very, very stressful. And that friend that I had throughout my life turned into somebody different when she was living with us. And I noticed that a lot of the her little peccadilloes and and habits that annoyed the crap out of me were things that I had in me. So when I realized that, and thank God she came because I, I realized that, oh, wow, I need to be, I hate to say a better person, but a different person. That opened the door to what I really wanted to paint, which was, you know, I have a love of history. I hate mankind, but I like people. And so I would, I, I thought, you know, I want to, I want to paint portraits. I want to paint people. I want to paint people's lives. So I, I started down that road and doing that got me into a very good gallery, prestigious gallery, Bayview in, in Brunswick, Main Street, Brunswick. Visit him today. And they have tremendous artists there. I mean, there's top of the line artists. So that helped, right? So now... I can I can paint things that mean something to me. And I leave the the sales and all that stuff behind. To me, it's try to paint something the best you can that resonates with you. And if it resonates with me, I'm an average dude. Maybe it'll resonate with someone else. You know, maybe they'll like it as well. And that's all I can hope for. Well, I, I mean, you said so many different things that are so powerful and i think that you know i i used to say do what you love to do and the money will follow i'm not saying that everyone becomes a millionaire if they follow their calling however what i will say is that whatever you are passionate about is the quickest way to live a joyful life because we also all know that we've heard you know that there's a reason we hear all of these idioms and adages and all of these things, right, about money. And we know that money can't buy happiness. We also know that being homeless is not a fun thing, right? You've got to have enough to support your life. But what is the most important thing is for people to live their most authentic life. That is the source of joy. It just is. I'm not... You know, oh, yeah. this is not th th this is not news to anyone. It's the courage, as I said earlier, to follow that. Because I've looked at some of your work, and I want you to share a painting or two. And we are on YouTube, so I know our audio people won't be able to see the work, but our YouTube listeners will. Because what struck me about the work is the way that you capture these moments in people's lives, ordinary moments that I think will touch people differently. But the one behind you of the black and white with color is just such, can you just hold it up to the camera so people can see it? 
And by the way, this is a beautiful angle of me. I, I hope we nope. take this. Awesome. <laughs> <Sure>. <laughs> but that's what of, I was kind of hoping this would only be only be on a podcast and not visual. Let's see the painting. Thank goodness I'm wearing pants. This this <laughs> painting is something I I I call this my continuum series. And by continuum, what I mean is as we know, life goes on. And the moment that we capture today and live in today turns into tomorrow and turns into the next day and life goes on. Now, for people who love history, and I'm one of them, you know, we look at the world around us and we see the residuals of what once was, right? That sun that shines down every once in a while here in New England, you know, <laughs> that was the same sun that was shining on a dinosaur's butt, you know? So it's it, it's a continuum. Now, a lot of people who don't who don't follow history, don't really get it. You know, all they know is what they've seen in, in their school books of these black and white pictures. They think that this is a time from some weird world where everybody was black and white, except they wore funny clothes. So what I'm trying to do with these these paintings in this particular series is, you know, nod to those who think of the world as black and white, but yet try to show them that it was filled with people who were just like you and me. Yeah. who had the same emotions, the same human traits, and, you know, show you that this this is how it was, but this is, you know, this may be what you think, but this is how it was. So I do these monochromatic paintings, and somewhere in there is one person, it's the focal point, where they're in color just to, to show you that this was the reality. And hopefully the person that I put in color gives you an idea of uh, that you can connect with and say oh look they're smiling they're laughing they're they're doing their thing like we do today and and what it evokes in me and i think that this is what i love about artwork is the difference between the woman on the on the right who is in black and white and the woman on the left who is in color i think so many of us who just do our day-to-day -day job that may not bring us joy we can live in that black and white world and when you do the thing that sparks you that lights you up that's when i feel like we are living we start to come alive and live in color you know i mean there were so many times after my brother's death that i called myself a zombie you know that i felt like i was just moving through the days. How many times have I heard friends say, I just want to get through the day? That's what this feels like to me when I see the difference between living in a black and white, a black and white world and living your life in color. So thank you for sharing that. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you for asking. And and we all face and, and deal with our emotions, our, our grief, you know, our, our aspirations differently for you you know, you realize that, oh, wow, this is consuming me in a way that I probably shouldn't let it anymore. So you, using your your memory of your brother, using him not as an example, but as as, as you're, you're, you're touched on to say, look, for him and me, I'm going to go and do this. Now, That's exactly why well, I love that you say, I love that you say that because it was my brother's death. And that's the whole point, right? It's it's when we are split wide open in our lives in all of these different ways. And I know I'm a broken record. I say this all the time. It's an invitation for us to step inside and bring light into our dark places and really think about who am I? What do I want to do? What brings me joy? What are the steps that I need to take to get me there? Because, you know, I heard a long, this was many years ago, a coach talked about why dreams die. And often it is because we can't hold the present and the future at the same time. It feels too far. It feels too far for me to get from here to over here where my dream lies. And so it falls away. Mm -hmm. And But what you had said earlier before we started recording were those steps and just one step, one action step every day can lead us closer and closer and closer to that dream. Because what we do today 
is what our future is going to look like, right? Literally what we think and what we do today, we are creating our future. Our future just doesn't happen like it happens <laughs> given the steps that we take to get us there. So how Absolutely. long how long now have you been a full-time artist? I have been full-time since 2008. Wow. So doing the math, that means several months. <laughs> I've never been good at math. I'm sorry. I was never good at math. So yeah, it's it's been a long time. But having been a worker bee punching the clock for 30 years before doing this, you know, it, it got me into the habit of getting up, getting dressed, going to work. I work. Day's done. I go home. You know, that's... This is the job. This is what I do. I love what I do. I get up every morning. Can't wait to get down here. I'm in my studio right now. It's a separate room off the house building, actually. I can't wait to get down here. You know, sometimes I'm sitting there, you know, watching television and my wife, Ellen, will look over and say, you're painting a picture right now, aren't you? I'm like, what? Yeah. <laughs> you know, because it's, it's consuming, but in a good way, right? And you mentioned about, you know, once your once your world has been broken apart, rocking your shine, finding that, you know, we are in the course of our lives, you know, we, we we're we're like ants, fragile as hell, but we got this shell. And as we we go through our lives and in, in public and in work, we keep adding layers and layers and layers of stuff so that that our shell can be toughened. And eventually we we lose sight of who we really are because we've got all of this shell around us. When you've been cracked open, it means that shell is going and the true you comes out. You know, I, yes. I am now the person that I always remember I was before all the other crap. And just for the record, I don't drink anymore. <laughs> i i traded that for other vices no i'm kidding i have no vices jesus calls me for you know like tidbits and advice that'll probably be edited out <laughs> probably anyway, not you know, you, so you find it's 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 your true self and when you get to your true self that's when the best part of you starts working and shining and doing what you love to do and again, the money stuff, will you make money? No, but you know what? You'll probably manage. <laughs> yes. You know, you'll manage. You'll get by. That's you know? the magic. That's the secret, right? I mean, I understand the buzzwords out there, manifestation and all of the things. I think that what, I think the deeper part of that, though, that gets lost sometimes in that simplistic translation is understanding that it is around the way we talk and think and treat ourselves, You know, people think often confuse self-love for selfishness and true self-love is when we can reconcile with, I don't like to call them mistakes. I like to call them experiences. Some people call them mistakes, but when we can really truly accept ourselves for all of who we are and understand that within each of us is within each of our core is light and love. That's who we are. And I love the way that you described the shell because as we get older, what we do is we put a harder shell around our heart because we think we're protecting ourselves. And really it's just the opposite is true. When we can completely embrace, accept who we are and shine that light, it gives others permission to shine their theirs too. That's where, that's our deepest connection. You know, I'm taking this course right now, this eight month course out of the Compassion Institute. It's this, you know, it's just a, he's this beautiful man. He's a Buddhist monk who lives in London. And I love- You could be teaching that course, but that's okay. <laughs> I love what he talks about where everybody, the only thing any of us want is- less suffering and more joy that's it right that's what that's what we want for ourselves it's what we want for our children we, we all want to suffer mm -hmm. less and live a happy life and at that at that at that core understanding 
that's where we can have compassion for people who cut us off, for people who might be cruel, for all of these different things that happen in our world. We can send compassion rather than hatred because it is through that compassion that we spread that light. And that is what ultimately will heal this world. But it starts one person at a time, literally. And mm -hmm. that is, and, and, and what I love so deeply about your story is you could, we have a choice. We can go one way or the other. You could have gone in numerous directions in your life. You could have abandoned your art. You could have really given into your addiction. I mean, there's just, we are constantly making choices. And addiction, by the way, is never the problem. It's always the solution to our pain, right? And so when we can find- It was a fun solution, but you know, it's not always that great. Yeah, it doesn't end well, right? Yes. So here, but here you are now, you are in this amazing partnership that you've been in for, very, for a long, long time. You are yes. doing what you love most, which is your art. I got chills. I think, and and you've reunited with me <laughs> as your friend. <laughs> yes, absolutely. For those who are, are watching on YouTube, this is exactly what I would see over the, we had desks that faced each other. Yeah, so this, this is the each other. wonderful view I had. Wonderful view. Every afternoon, Sue would come in. And I'd and laugh just... my head off the whole time as you would make me laugh. <laughs> and and so it was no coincidence though, this this because as um, my listeners know too, that I recently left my own 30 year corporate job to to really do what I love most, which is the art of storytelling and bringing people's stories to the world. So I want to ask you, Kev, Kevin, because now we are 45 minutes in. Is there anything else you would like to share? With our listeners, you know, we don't get a lot of men on the show and they're not as forthcoming with, I think, sometimes the heartache. And you, of course, I know humor is something that you use and I love it. I, I have such a deep appreciation. Mm -hmm. But were there moments in this where really you thought that you just didn't know, you know, felt really lost and what were you going to do next and I, i'm just curious i didn't ask you this before we in our last car preparing for this so i'm just curious well you know that's a, that's a very good question i have to say that all through all of the years that i i was a mess i always knew that it was going to end someday and it was going to get better i always had that faith and i was always curious to see how it was going to end so you know it's like waiting to open up that christmas present you know you know it's there you just wonder what it is and that's really how i felt through all of that misery i think all right i'm going through all of this wonder why and wonder you know what for what what is it going to look like so i always had that faith no matter how bad i felt no matter what misery i went and even i could laugh at me for even going through it. So in, in that regard, no matter how deeply troubled you may be, and I don't want to be, you know, trite on this, you know, there is an end. It may not be what you want, but it's it's going to end. You know, all things must pass. That's how I viewed it. I love that because I Another thing I often talk about is that everything happens, everything that happens to us is for us. It's for our own growth and our own expansion. That's why you'll hear, have the attitude of gratitude, right? And people want to punch you in the face when you say that, because it's difficult to be grateful when you are going through these horrific experiences in life. Sometimes we can't have the gratitude while we're in it. It comes later and say, oh, I understand why that happened, because look what happened as a result of that. But that's that resilience piece. I mean, it's the law of the universe, you know, that it's balance. Bad things happen, good things happen. And it's how do we not react, but respond to those things that happen to us that make the difference. So thank you for that. I always end my interviews on two questions. Okay. 
So the first one is, oftentimes when we have these things that happen to us in life, it changes the way we think about self-love. What does that word mean? What does self-love mean to you? How does that show up for you in your life? Well, that's 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 a hard, hard question because most people who are creative don't have a great deal of self-love. They have, and I'm, I'm, I'm fairly serious here for me. I, I know it's, you're serious. Because it's, it's, you're trying to get better at whatever you're doing. So if you love everything about you and what you're doing, you're not going to grow. So it's, it's almost a trap, but self-love merely means is you can look in the mirror and not despise the person looking back, not questioning why are you doing this every time you look. I, I, I That's for me just the short answer. That's beautiful. Finish the sentence for me. Hope is. Hope is, I believe, really it's 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 the zip line, right? It's it's what keeps you going. You're on the zip line, you're screaming along, you're 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 afraid. Oh my God. But hope is the line that keeps you up. You hope you're not gonna smack into the tree at the end of the zip line, but it's the thing that that keeps you up and not hitting the ground. I love that. And I love what you said earlier too, is that no matter what was happening, you knew it was going to get better. And I, and I think that that's true for the zip line, right? You're never in the same place twice. Like you literally keep moving forward. Can't go backward on a zip mm-hmm. line. So that's really, that, that is the first time anyone's ever used that analogy, Kevin. So thank you for that. <laughs> well, you're welcome. Before we wrap up, is there anything else that you'd like to say that I haven't asked you? Can we just go back and do the whole thing all over again? I'm so happy that you're doing this and you're being you. And there's no, no question you can ask me. It's just that my heart and my love goes out to you. So for being you. Thank you. I feel the same way, Kevin. And thank you for your gorgeous artwork. And tell people again, we'll have, because people can also buy your artwork off your website, right? I'm www dot kmeisner one word dot com and yeah. if you google you know kevin meisner m-i-z-n-e-r um you'll probably come up with that that website and we'll have has, all of, and we will also have your links we'll have your social media links and we'll have your website in the show notes for those of you who want to check out kevin's work it's truly beautiful i actually bought one uh, of his early uh, pieces many many years ago So Kevin, thank you so much for taking the time to be here today. I want to thank all of my listeners for tuning in. I hope you guys take a nugget and take something from this conversation that can help you on your own journey. You guys have a wonderful day, a wonderful week, and I love you. We'll see you here next week. Bye for now.